Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi, I am uh, Luke Roy, I guess we'll, and uh, the co-owner of Old Rock, so some of you probably know of Old Rock. I see some people with competitive cups, so hopefully I'll, I'll uh, figure out a way to convert you. So um, I'm actually here to talk to you a little bit about Old Rock and our experience of, uh, of Old Rock. And, um, and my title of my presentation is, Are You Crazy? Okay, so you gotta, you, you gotta get a sense of when you're an entrepreneur, an, an entrepreneur you, you, really, uh, you really are crazy at the end of the day. And when we started this idea about Old Rock, um, you know, my dad basically, my mom said, oh, that's nice. And my dad says, are you crazy? He says, have you heard of a place called Tim Hortons? <laughs> Well, it's true. It's true at the end of the day that you almost have to be crazy because when we started, there were 26 Tim Hortons just in Sudbury, and now there's a few extra. There were two Starbucks and uh, four downtown coffee shops. And some of you know that we are basically downtown. And um, it, it's true. You, you really have to be crazy. And, um, but at the end of the day, get used to it. If anybody's an entrepreneur, you got to get used to it for people telling you that you're crazy. It's because you are uh, probably jinxed in the sense that you've got an idea and you're really burning inside just to create something out of this, whether it's a product, a service, or a design of some kind. That's, you're really jinxed. And in fact, you're practically uh, what I refer to as blindly determined. Um, it's hard to get out. And, and if you have those elements, then you're probably fit as a true entrepreneur. And that's what happens with, with coffee and old rock. We were so, so much, um, how would I say that, just, just you know, in, inside us that we, we needed to do something. So uh, the, the background is basically we moved from California. We had great coffee in California. There were actually coffee houses, roasters, and so on. And we couldn't find anything in Subray. And that's why we decided, you know what? We need something here. So Carol started roasting. And, and next thing you know, it, it took on a, a life of its own. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But you got to be smart about it. If any of you, I mean, you're, you got, again, focus, you're jinxed, you're going to go and, and do something. But you got to be focused and smart about it. And by smart, I mean, yeah, you got to do all your business cases. And I'm not going to teach you about business cases. There's so much you can get out there. But there's actually a couple of things that we've learned along the way, which is critical if you want to start a business. And, and there's two things, two things that I will leave you in terms of ideas. The first one is get advisors. So my background is I did six technology startups, four of them in, in Silicon Valley and two of them in, in Toronto. And basically what I did is I applied the same principles of starting a business and getting advisors. Now, a lot of people will say, well, I don't want to divulge my idea. Well, get over it. You have to. You have to, and you have to confide in people that, of course, you are willing to, to trust. But advisors are critical. So we have an advisor. In fact, we have four advisors. We have two in the technology world and two on the coffee world. And one of them was an advisor for Tip Morton, Starbucks, and Timothy's. So this guy knows his stuff. He's far. He's, not, he's expensive too. But we actually uh, got him on board. And we made some decisions that if it wouldn't be for them, I wouldn't be here. I'll be honest with you. So advisors is a big one. The other one is three clear milestones in your business case. Exit strategies. So what I mean by this is that uh, I've got a couple of examples is that give yourself some milestones and, and they don't have to be really extravagant. In fact, let me show you one. This is actually from 2004. Um, I found this on, on we, this is a business plan that we did as a family. And basically we said, here's phase one. So we got an idea and so on. So first thing, learn to roast coffee. Okay, sounds simple. But we put it down there. Identify the ideal blends, and you'll keep on going. See this? Have early sales to up to six customers. <laughs> I can tell you, you don't run a business on six customers. Yeah. But you start somewhere. It doesn't matter what the milestones are. But give yourself milestones. And you'll see that for every milestone, 
Give yourself an exit strategy. In other words, before I go to phase two, I want to make sure that it's phase one. And look at this. I mean, <laughs> I look back, that's more than 10 years ago. And it basically says, if satisfaction is great, it doesn't say if it's good. It says if it's great. So that was a, a determination that we had. And then go to phase two. Uh, and if not, then rework it. There's nothing wrong with reworking it. And these actually plan can change. Here's another one, phase two. So now phase two is this. So identify an ancillary offering to complete our, our, our offer. And at the time we were thinking, well, why would people want to buy our coffee? Of course it's got to be good. But so we actually came up with the little Melita scoop and we approached Melita and bought a thousand scoops. So whenever somebody would buy a bag of coffee, they would get a scoop. So that's kind of what we did. We also came up with, come up with the initial offer, creating a website that you can order and so on. And, and we knew at that time that Christmas was coming. So we said to ourselves, if sales can be more than $500, then we can go to phase three. Otherwise, let's reanalyze. And if it doesn't really work, then abandon. I mean, we tried it, abandon it. And that's basically was our, our plan. And, um, and I'll tell you more about that. And then in, 2000, in 2007, we had completed our entire business plan in three years. And this was basically, uh, our exit strategy was to have our own store, which we did in 2007. And then we started creating our next business plan. And I'll share with you our next business plan, which is basically is that we're just completing now, which is optimized retail, increased number of stores. So we've got two stores. And then the other one was new avenue for Canada wide go to market. And I will t I'll tell you about this. So are we crazy? <laughs> I would say yes. But you know, with that craziness, you got to put a plan together and execute it. So, so again, get used to the idea that, you know, if somebody tells you you're crazy, that should give you more fuel, but be smart about it. Check with others, check with your, your advisors to see if you're doing the right thing. And differentiation, there's so many other things that comes into play. So how, how did we uh, get started? Um, so it was really, uh, you know the farmer's market. So uh, Carol is, is the other co-owner, so that's my wife. And she decided to uh, sell her coffee at the farmer's market. And you, you, you have to imagine at the farmer's market, because we, we got in there so late, we couldn't be inside the farmer's market where it was warm in, in the spring. So we had a little table <laughs> outside by ourselves. So, you, you know, people would come around and would look at us and would say, uh, you know, we kind of look at us all saying, what are these little bags and what are you doing there? We had one person coming by saying, have you heard of Tim Hortons? And of course we answered no. <laughs> no, joking. You know, and that's, that's the, how would I say that? That's the kind of issues that you're dealing with when you're really starting in a highly competitive environment. And you know what? Today, it doesn't matter what you do, it's highly competitive. I can tell you that. Think about one idea and it's highly competitive. But it shouldn't take away from your ambitions because it's always doable. You just gotta have a good plan. So Carol, in fact, she was um, selling the coffee and uh, I told her, I said, why don't you just abandon, okay? Because it's, it's, it's not working. So she basically said, well, I've already paid till the end of the June it was, and she started in May, so I said, well, I might as well keep on going. And that's what made the difference. She started selling. So that's, that's, um, that's how we got started. So 10 years later, so what do we have we achieved? Um, we have two locations, three outlets. We won numerous awards. Uh, our K-Cups are coming this summer, so we've had a lot of requests for that. In fact, we just got the financing, so the K-Cups are coming. Um, in 2000, December 2013, very little, little fact, we were in all the Costco's of Ontario. Imagine that. Uh, just a little shop, but uh, we're also in final negotiation of a first franchise. 
In fact, we're having four conversations. One of them is being uh, very seriously considered right now. We're in a final uh, negotiation, and there's three others going on. Unreal, unreal. Um, I'm not gonna give you the details of the franchise because it makes it a very low obstacle uh, to get into the business and being differentiated. Um, and we're, we're still in business at $2 a cup. So $2 a cup, that's how we measure everything we spend. So we're very frugal, um, we're very careful on what we spend it on, and, uh, and that's basically our, our measurement when we do anything. So for example, we have our, um, we have our own uh, uh, cups coming, finally. Uh, we had our own cups. We had to abandon them because when you're a small guy, uh, you find all these issues, they were leaking. We were really adamant about having a compostable cup and they were leaking and people got a little bit pee when it leaked on them and I don't blame them. It took us two years to find something that would work. So we found it. It's actually, to give you a little idea, it's actually doubles. You don't need sleeves and they're gonna be really cool looking. So that's, that's, that's all of it. So why are we still in business? I'm, glad, I'm happy you asked because that's a really good question. Um, it's because of why. I know, <laughs> funny answer, but it's basically people are buying from us for a reason and I'll tell you exactly why. Um, of course you need a good product, in fact a great product. In this day and age, you gotta have one. So our product is a little bit more expensive than other places, but we're very selective. It's pretty impressive, we're just a small shop still, okay? And when we, people we buy from Montreal, sometimes they'll call us, they'll say, well, Carol, Luke, I don't think it's gonna meet your quality. That really says something, that really says something. Um, so, of course, but I'm not going to bewilder that because I think everybody understands this. But what we've done is we've, every time we sell, we create a relationship and identity. Well, it's just a cup of coffee you're thinking about. But to us, it's not. It's more than that. In fact, um, We have a lot of identities. You'll see all of our blends. All of our blends have a unique uh, character, um, unique name. Um, so for example, uh, the Black Bear's Bud is always one of the top sellers. And we will know, you know, when somebody comes in and, and says, I'm not too sure which coffee I want, then we'll ask them a bunch of questions and I'm gonna show you, divulge a little bit of our secret. And basically we're gonna say, ha, ah, you're a Black Bear's Bud. So, but, but people relate to that. And that's what we do. That's the extra effort that we've done. And what we've actually, um, if you want to know the mustache, <laughs> that's the Earl Grey. That's our Earl Grey tea. And we came out with our teas about two years ago, all organic teas. And again, what we do is we sell an identity. We don't sell all rock brand. We sell you an identity. Uh, the Beaver Dam. You, if you're damn star, smart, <laughs> you're probably gonna drink the beaver dam. The D stands for dam, but anyway. So, um, so what we've learned from this is that we became sommelier of coffee. I mean, that's, that's if you refer to a sommelier de vin uh, or wine sommelier in English, you'll see that people actually understand your needs and then they will match you to the best wine. But we do the same thing for coffee. We have customers that are actually buying three types of coffees all at once. They got one in the morning, one in the afternoon or, or at, at dinner, and one in the evening. And this is no word of a lie. We have people that try all kinds and we have people that actually pick one. But that's what we're all about. And that, you'll see that uh, the Summit Yeet Cafe is coming in all of our branding now. So in our cups, and our, uh, our K-Cups, the box to the K-Cups and so on, that's all coming. Um, we actually recommend coffee. We recommend, and this is the training that we've gotten. I don't want to go through this, nor do I want you to read it because this is very confidential. But we've actually created training to, for our staff to understand how to recommend coffee, how to make that, that connection with coffee. 
And then basically from this, they can actually then see and then correlate it to the right coffee. In fact, this is going to be on the website. So when people buy from the website, that's going to be there. That's basically our approach. And because of why? Because of why. That's why. And, and, and when I did this, when I prepared for this, when I was asked to present, I spoke to one of our advisors and he basically said, Luke, have you seen the TED talk about why? And I did not. And sure enough, well, I highly recommend, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to know, I recommend the TED Talk by Simon Sinek because he basically touches what I was not able to really communicate or really understand, but he basically communicates. It's not about the what you're selling. It's about why you're selling it. And, and that's what it's all about. And that's basically the, the path that we went on. So focus on the why. And then, I feel like it's 10 years later and we're just starting. So hopefully you're going to see a lot of other locations popping up, in fact, and, uh, and it's, it's going to be you know, uh, uh, culminating pretty soon. You're going to see that. You're going to see a lot of new things going on uh, with the store and so on, and, uh, which makes it uh, very exciting. So that's the story of Old Rock. And let me talk to you a little bit about myself. I mentioned, but I'm actually a high tech, uh, I won't say a guru, but junkie for lack of better say. I've worked in the technology business. Uh, it's funny, I work at Laurentian University and when I got there, I basically realized that three, three products were my products that I actually defined. So I, I was responsible for the definition of the product, not developing it, but defining it defining the marketing for it, the go-to-market strategy. And I was responsible for the strategy. That's what I did for more than 10 years, in fact. And that, it's funny because I never thought coffee would, you would take the similar path, but we did. A startup actually gets advisors. Basically, they answer to people in the, for advisors. So that's basically my background. Um, some companies got purchased by, some of you know Siemens, uh, some of you know Cisco. Um, th those are examples of companies that actually purchased the companies that I was uh, actually part of. And what about Carol? So her background is nursing. So nurses drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> and um, they also appreciate good coffee, and that's what Carol did. So when I brought her to California, she couldn't work there. So and that's when she got all the experience of coffee. And that's when she got to know some roasters and to learn tricks of the trades. And in fact, what we did to make sure we had the best product, we flew to Vienna. And why Vienna? So we did our searches. And you have, you have to have different, uh, a very, uh, f you have to have philosophies. And we have a specific philosophy on coffee. We don't believe in over-roasting it. We don't believe in you should, the coffee should be, you know, the, the roast should empower the coffee. You should always taste the coffee, then the roast. And that, that was Carol's philosophy. And it turns out that in Vienna, they have a Vienna roast, which is basically kind of a, a slightly darker medium roast, but that's basically was that. And she wanted to go there just to make sure that she's got the right ingredient and the right path. And that basically created the foundation of our coffees. So we have a, a full city roast that we sell almost none of, which is very light. We have a Vienna, we have a French, which is darker, and an Italian, which is much darker. But still the Italian will taste sweet and not overly powered. And that's on purpose. And that's what Carol's all about. Um, there are some examples that you'll see on our website in terms of uh, top sellers. And I just want to close with, uh, you'll see on our website when people order, uh, it's free delivery in Northern Ontario. So as long as you order uh, at least a pound of coffee, it's free delivery. And it's also free delivery for any sizes within the greater Sudbury. And that's something on our website. Um, so at this time, uh, that's pretty much my presentation and I will open up to Q and A's. Thank you.
Uh, yes, timelines are very important. So we add loose timelines because we weren't sure how long it would take. But it's an excellent question. Uh, the question is, did we have timelines around our milestones? And the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, if I would show you the more detailed plan, we had specific dates once we understood the roasting aspect, we had specific dates already identified. And the reason why timelines are really uh, important is because if you think about an idea, I can guarantee you that there's at least five other ones that have thought about the same idea. So timing is everything. Urgency is everything. Uh, urgency just uh, for the fact of going to market as soon as possible is not the right idea. But urgency of doing the proper diligency and so on is very important. That's why timelines are really important. So that's, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. So how do you get around free shipping? It's one of those things that you balance because what happens is that most people don't order a pound of coffee. Our average, what if, what if I do? But, but, but I will get to that. So the question is, is that how can you afford sending for a pound of coffee? In fact, if you take the average, uh, and I'll give you another example which is going to be clearer. If you take the average, the average is about five pounds that people order. I'm willing to take a loss for a pound if the next order is going to be two, three pounds. Even if it's a pound all the time, that's fine. But typically people order more than a pound and that's what we've learned. Um, so at a pound of coffee, we're, we're lucky if we break even depending on the type of coffee. Absolutely. But again, we're on the why. And the why is we cannot phantom the idea that people are is drinking bad coffee. When we wake up Saturday morning and we have our cup of coffee, it's, it's got to be a good cup of coffee. So, um, and it's serving us well. The same thing with the other idea with gift cards, okay? Um, it turns out that if you do, if, if you're in business for a little while and you look at your gift cards, almost 50% of the people don't redeem the gift cards. So, so what did we do? Hey, you want to use a gift card? Whatever money you put on, we're going to add 10, 15, or 20 percent, depending on your age group. And that's what we do. We give it back. So it sounds like, you know, if you start calculating, it could be a loss. But in fact, you still, you still uh, earn the, uh, the respect and the business of the people by doing so. So, and you can amortize. People, people always want value, okay? And you got to show value somehow. And we've determined ways of uh, showing value and offering a, a better service, let's say. And even though at lower, a lower end, it costs us money, um, it, it still serves us really well and we're still profitable. Uh, we are more expensive, clearly more expensive. Uh, and I don't hide a, about it because one is we do pick, uh, I'll give you an example. Colombian coffee has 12 classifications, okay? They have the lower quality and they have the top quality called Excelsos. So we buy the top quality fair trade organic and people recognize that. And, and you can taste the difference. So now what is our price point difference? I can tell you that uh, if you look at a Folgers, uh, and uh, we're more than twice the price. But if you look at something, uh, you know, uh, more in line with us, let's say even a Starbucks and so on, then we are a little bit more expensive, but not that much more expensive. So, so again, people are, 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 are looking at both sides. And also, I don't know if you know this, but we roast all our coffee. And our coffees, in fact, we've got a lot of bins. If you've ever been in the store, we have over 85 varieties of coffee, okay? We have the Kopi Lulak. <laughs> um, if anybody's interested, I'll give you a really good deal on Kopi Lulak. Uh, Kopi Lulak is the bucket list coffee. And we even offer it in Sudbury. We've had people uh, journeying, we have a lot of tourists that actually, Oh, okay, I'm sorry, so you, very good point. Where does, what is the Kopilula coffee? It's the coffee that wildcats eat and they excrement. And people pick it up afterwards and they dry it up and we put it in a roaster and we roast it. <laughs> um, no shit. <laughs> no shit, yeah. And 
<coughs> Actually, uh, it tastes it tastes good. Um, yeah, uh, it wouldn't be my everyday coffee, but it, if it's on your bucket list, I can help you on that one. Uh, but but we have all these types and, and Jamaican Blue Mountain. Uh, well, we have also the Jamaican Eye Mountain, Jamaican Blue Mountain. Cuban coffee is my favorite. So we really cater to those who are, uh, you know, when you buy your wine, do you buy it from the LCBO or do you buy it from the vintage section? We really cater to the people in the vintage. But somebody who just wants a good cup of coffee, that usually works out well. And our demographics are, um, are really, uh, surprised us. Our demographics is really everybody, but I can give you what the sweet point is, and I don't want to, um, uh, to uh, how would I say that, to foreign myself from, from other customers. But our sweet point, no, our sweet point, a uh, sweet spot, is actually ladies more than men, and it's ladies between, okay, on average, 25 years old. That's basically who are, is our sweet spot. And, um, and we cater to that. And, and interesting enough, you do advertising. If you go on Q92, we get very little return. We actually advertise on kicks, we get a lot of return. Interesting, it's very interesting dynamics. And, and you know, we talk a lot about in the industry, and again, I'm a technology guy, about big data, you know, to do analytics and so on. There's a lot of value in big data. There's a lot of value, and I can tell you as a little guy, as just making notes with my pen, uh, I don't do my pen, but on my iPad, let's say, I can tell you that there's a lot of merits to that. And that really caters to how we present ourselves. But you know what's interesting? Those 25-year-old ladies, they bring friends with them. And a lot of times, it's men. So we cater really to everybody, and sometimes it's grandparents. So we really cater to, to everybody uh, in terms of, and I think that was a long-winded answer to a specific question. So. Well, I mean, uh, you know, when you start and, and you have very little, I mean, NORCAT has a great, a lot of resources, so we definitely recommend to use NORCAT. When we started, we didn't have, uh, let's say NORCAT has changed significantly since Don came in, and that would have been a resource that we would have valued quite a bit, so I highly recommend that one. At the time when we started, the two resources were the internet. It's amazing what you can find from the internet. Uh, if you haven't tried it, I would strongly recommend it. And the other one is our advisors. Our advisors, uh, I'll give you an example. The store, if you haven't been to the store, it's designed for an experience. And, and, it's, and we would never have known unless that uh, expert, who's actually an old groggy guy, who actually, you know, uh, when you, I, we visited him, and he, he's in, based in California, and he's the type that has, doesn't look at you, you know, he works while you're talking, and he's still advising, but he says only a few things. And when we came up with our franchise idea, he stopped, he turned around and says, oh my God, you got it. I've worked with thousands of companies, but you've got the model. You got to stop everything, do that. Anyway, that's a different discussion, but that's what we're implementing right now. But basically, he would, he would at one point, I didn't trust him, okay? Um, and he basically said, Luke, then stop wasting my time. And that's when I realized, you know what? He knows something that I don't know. And that's, you know, when you say, you, when you're actually flying with uh, just instrumentation, when you're actually in a startup and you're an entrepreneur and you have a good advisor, you will have to fly by instrumentation. I can tell you that. Because they know and you don't know. We have another advisor that basically said, Luke, you got to purchase everything. Well, come on. How do you purchase a building, purchase everything, purchase everything? He says, then don't get me involved unless you purchase everything. Well, we figured that out a way to purchase everything. And that's what, so the advisors became a great source of information. Um, you know, quite often advisors will say no. And you're like, oh, I, I want to do this. No, nope, don't do it. You're going to be deviating from the path. And you really have to trust them. Now, there could be some advisors that are not very good. Uh, so you really have to be selective. In fact, 
um, all of our advisors, we researched and we basically then found them. We, they were not journey people that we came across saying, hey, you want to be an advisor? No, they were people that we actually sought. And there's one of them that I sought and I still can't find them, but somebody assured me that they will uh, be able to help us. Um, on the milestones, it's so variant depending on what you want to do. Um, but it was pretty clear that our first business case, the exit strategy, is we had to make some money. It was, it was, it was pretty clear. So the, for us, what it worked out is that, so <laughs> the lonely booth on the, on the farmer's market, in fact, it was so cold, we had to wear a jacket. Somebody even came by and said, well, at least you should serve coffee to warm people up and warm yourself up. And we didn't even have, we just had the little bags and, and different colors. And it was clear that our milestone was to make some money. And, and the way it, it, it really uh, reproduced itself is that, you know, one of the phases was, you know, learn how to roast, roast well, have your bland, and so on. But we've noticed, we've started really cheap, which is at the farmer's market. And I am actually a big supporter of the farmer's market because you know what? Starbucks started at the farmer's market, I've learned. Um, I, I've learned a few things other than that the second location they ever opened was on across the street from the first location. A lot of people ask, well, why did you open a second location so close? Well, because people don't go out of their way for coffee. They really like to go in the path. You, uh, you can become a destination, but quite often most of the revenue is not from a destination, it's from walkthroughs. And that's why you have to be, so we, we basically did a milestone. And when we were selling our coffee the following year, Carol basically said, maybe we should serve coffee so people can taste it. Wow, well, maybe we can charge for it. And that's what we did at the farmer's market. And at the end of the first year of the farmer's market, or maybe it was the second year, we started looking at the numbers and we started doing the math and we said, wow, imagine if we could do this every day. And that's basically what allowed us, we knew we wanted a store, but that success allowed us to get to our exit strategy, which was open up the first store. And that, that's how, so that was out of the, in this particular one, we had five phases, five milestones, and it was the fourth one that really gave us an idea that we could make some money. For us, it took, uh, well, if you consider uh, the first, the, uh, we started making money after, from 2004, we went all, all the way up to about 2006 is when we determined that we can make some money. So two years, yeah, two years, I didn't realize that. And then the third year, we opened the location. That's a, that's, a really good, that's a really good one. Uh, we've talked to people who, thought, who I thought were good advisors and they've admitted that they were not a good advisor and recommended people. So what we've done is we've looked for somebody who was in the coffee field, who was about manufacturing coffee. And that's, if you wanna know what's the distinction about Old Rock, we're truly a, a coffee manufacturer with a retail. That's really what we are. And so we focus on somebody who's, who's doing the manufacturing. So the way we found this particular person is we found out some, we knew other roasters and we asked around, who do, would you recommend, who do you recommend? And there's one name that actually popped up more than once. And that's how we found this one. The next one was somebody who worked at a Tim Hortons who, who had its own little cafe. Um, you would think that probably they wouldn't talk to us because they don't want to have us, but you would be surprised that the true good advisors, they want to share their, uh, their knowledge. In fact, that's why I'm a mentor here, because I, I want to share what I've done and I want to see other people growing. I've got some other ambition, which is I believe that in Sudbury, we should have our own manufacturers of everything why not having a car manufacturer? Why not having a manufacturer of this and that? You know, a lot of times we think, oh, we're too small. We're not too small. We're big enough. So get advisors that, that you know, you ask around and the two good advisors, they will advise you. They're the one actually, the little cafe who was renting a place is the one who said, you gotta buy everything. I mean, wow. 
the, 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 the big manufacturer guy, he's the one who basically helped us design the store and create the right karma for the store. He's the one who also tested our coffee, which we still do. An interesting fact is that um, he basically told us, he said, women are not good coffee roasters. So master roasters, we call them. In fact, men are, and, and, and so on. Very few ladies. So we, we, we thought, <laughs> Carol's the master roaster. He's the best one to really analyze. And he basically, still to this day, will tell us, I don't understand how Carol can make it so consistently, so good, with a, 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 an old machine. We specifically found an old roaster in Czechoslovakia. <laughs> We found it there. No, again, very meticulous on the product, on having a quality product. And that's how we're able to determine this is the type of roaster we want. Let's look for it. And then we found it in Czechoslovakia. We shipped it to California. This guy actually refurbished the way we wanted it and then sent it to us. Um, we're actually, for the first time in December, uh, we finally raised our hand and, and it's really too small for our business, uh, which is a good problem, but also a little bit of a challenge. Um, typically, Carol takes uh, a week and a half off during holidays and she had to roast half the time because too much demand, which is a good problem. <laughs> so those are the examples. And then another example is we found two other guys in the technology. So I know technology and when I've realized that a lot of similarity that's when I said, I need a couple of technology advisors. And it turns out that one of them is, is silent. The other one though, unbelievable how he's actually, um, it's almost it feels like he's sleeping with us in the sense that when we, if you've seen our bag, he's the one that was adamant to have the story of the bag, the story about how old rock started. And it's true, it's part of answering of the why. It's, it's, and, and so that's why you'll have it both in English and French on the bag. And, and again, finding advisors is difficult. You don't find them like that. But it's amazing if you start looking for them, you will find them. The one guy I can find um, is basically the guy who started, one of two guys actually started the second cup. And I want to talk to this other guy who started second cup. And uh, so I know exactly his name. I've tried to reach out to him. Uh, I'm sure he's, he's having fun in the sun kind of thing, but uh, I, I, I will get to him. Um, and again, I, I cannot, I cannot, how would I say that? I cannot, you know, tell you how important it is to get advisors, okay? Um, to, to me, to me, to be honest with you, you'll, you won't succeed unless you have advisors. I can tell you that on the technology business, I was in the networking technology, and we basically got the guy who wrote what we call a request for comment, an RFC. That's a technical term for a standard in the uh, IP or in, in internet protocol, so the internet. And he wrote it, and we basically got him to, to be part of an advisor because you know what he said the first time we met with him? I wrote the RFC, but it doesn't really work. <laughs> Holy jeez! But talk about Talk about the best advisor. He's the one who created the protocol and admitted that it doesn't really work. Thank God we found out before we started building the product. You see what I mean? That's the kind of stuff. And, and sometimes <laughs> you got to swallow your pride. Quite often you got to swallow your pride. But that's okay. You'd rather be no upfront that you can't do the opportunity instead of belittling, wasting people's time, and, and even wasting your own time because I, I did six startups, All Rock is my seventh one, okay? I did seven startups, yes, I just turned 50 not too long ago, but we're, people can do multiple startups. So don't waste too much time on a startup if its re reality is there. But at the same time, if you're jinx and you're blindly determined to make it successful, I highly recommend go for it, go for it until you don't, you get those obstacles and, and you know, there's a few reality checks, but uh, you know, there's nothing better than a reality check when your old man basically tells you, you know, are you smoking drugs? <laughs> yeah, but, and you know a funny story? So, <laughs> so my, my mom is very, yeah, my mom is very supportive. So, um, so basically one day my dad wakes up and he drinks the coffee and he goes, oh my God, Luke and Carol's coffee's terrible. What's wrong with that? 
And she turns around, she says, we just ran out of coffee, I'm feeding you Folgers. So then he got it. That's when he figured out, oh, we're onto something, you know? Yeah. So coffee was, was definitely one, manufacturing coffee. We had another one which was the service aspect, so serving coffee, um, having a retail front. Uh, me and Carol never opened up a retail location. So, um, and then the other two fields were technology because it's people that I trusted, but it turns out that one of them has really good insights of business in general. Um, and and that's, that's how we, you know, how we actually selected them. Again, you, you will find it inside when you've hit the right one uh, because they are typically very honest. And if you're the type of person who doesn't like direct, you know, what we call, uh, you know, let me talk to you directly, then don't get in business because you're not going to succeed. Uh, um, you know what's amazing when you're starting a small business? When you're sleeping at night, nothing gets done. So when you're working during the day and you're not working on your business, nothing gets done. That's a, that's a wall all on its own um, until you grow to a certain capacity. But walls, walls, you have to be careful with walls because walls could be a true indication that you're doing something wrong or it could be also an indication that, you know, uh, it's really to test your, you know, if you're, if you're good at it. There's nothing... Um, it sounds funny, but there's nothing better when somebody says your coffee sucks. The, because you really have to find it in yourself to understand why. We had somebody coming in saying it, coffee sucks. And it's like, wow, you know, it's, we're not used to that. <laughs> so we started asking questions and, and questioning ourselves. But once we asked, asked the question, this gentleman didn't realize that he needed to grind the, bean, the beans. <laughs> well, okay, so... I, I know it sounds, but it did happen. It did happen. Um, and, and, you know, that's a funny wall kind of thing. But there were some other walls for sure. Um, you know, they, 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 on our K-Cups, K-Cups, we were supposed to come out with them a year ago. And um, we had everything lined up. And it's a Chinese company, which I don't like dealing with, not because I don't like Chinese people, but I prefer supporting local as much as possible. And we were about to embark on this journey, and uh, a little voice basically told me, said, hey, you checked with this guy. This guy said everything was good. Why don't you check with him again? All right, check with him again. Next thing you know, he said it's the worst experience, the worst company you work with, and while uh, six months ago, he basically was the right thing. Um, it's not necessarily a wall, but you've got a lot of these challenges coming up. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, you, you, you really have to take a breath, a breath, breathe, analyze, ask the questions, and then, and then analyze if it's about yourself or the, the product you represent. Uh, you know, ask yourself was the right thing. When we started the business, we never thought fair trade organic would work. So when we actually were selling our coffee, we didn't have any fair trade organic, only because we never thought that people in Sudbury would support that. Um, talk about testing. When somebody came over and says, don't you have fair trade organic coffee? It's like, oh, you know about that. Um, and, and this was back in 2005, okay? So it's not like, and, and, and then, then it, it, that's how we adjust it. That's why the farmer's market is a great environment. You want to talk to all kinds of various people walking through there and giving you all kinds of, you know, we had somebody coming over saying, tasting the coffee and going, mmm, I taste a little bit of this. I think that bean is not roasted enough, blah, blah, blah. It's like, holy geez, he's an expert. No, he was just fooling around and then we didn't even know better, right? I mean, th those, those things happen, but that's okay. I, you know the old saying, what doesn't kill you, uh, you know, makes you stronger? This is so true, so true. That's why I love when people say things like, I don't love it, but if people say my face, you know, you guys suck or whatever. It, it really forces you to really realign and really understand why, and maybe sometimes you'll say, ah, oh, that's just somebody saying that. But sometimes, 
oh, you know what? There's a little comment there. Oh, we got to look at it. And, and you really have to listen like that. So I think, I think there's a lot of walls. You just got to analyze. Analyze and pick a path. And, and quite often, when you analyze, you got to look at yourself and saying, what do I want to be when I grow up? That is such a question that is so key when you start a business. Um, I never realized it um, uh, until I, I basically moved out of, of Silicon Valley. Um, because in Silicon Valley, they don't care about your, um, your background, your academic background. They care about your pedigree. They told me this up front. It's all about your pedigree. It's about what you've done. They don't care. My best employee, in fact, in California was a guy who just had a grade 12. Didn't have a university education, didn't have an MBA, didn't have anything. In, in today, he's like a senior VP for a company called Alcatel, uh, that's, which is a big company. But th those, those are, uh, all of this just to say that you, you, learn, you learn that, um, I'm not sure now the question I was really answering because I go in tangents, but what's that? The walls. But, but you... you you really have to, to look at yourself and say, what am I really? Like, for example, uh, we could have a, a really nice place with alcohol and so on. Uh, absolutely. But we don't want that. We are a roaster. When you come to us, I don't want you guys to know us for our Spanish coffee. I want you to know us because we're going to tell you what's the best coffee for you. And that's what we're, we're all about. And, and you really, that's a good, it's a good question about asking yourself, who are you? Because that's going to define who you are, which defines the why, which is, I realize now, I could never communicate that five years ago, but I realized how important that was. Okay, so, so let me answer that, and I'll answer it very honestly. If you've got an investor that expects you to make money in six months, you don't have the right investor. I was in Silicon Valley, and we had investments of up to the order of 26 to $72 million. And we didn't make a damn buck for three years. Um, it takes time, and especially in this competitive world today, you better be patient, but you also have to have the determination. Now, I understand, it's not like you can spend 15 years without a profit. I mean, you gotta pay the kids or, or feed the kids, right? And all that stuff, absolutely. But in, in, my, in, in my experience, is six months is, you know, if you can do it, great. Well, but from six months to one year usually. Even one year. I can tell you from my own experience, and, and this, is, this is how much we actually went. We bought the building. So we owed, we owed money to ourselves, but we never paid ourselves, not right away. So just to make sure that we can make a running business out of it. And I can tell you that my wife Carol had her full, full, first full salary last year. It takes time, but it, it's a decision. It's a decision. Some people may not be able to do that, but we opted to basically put the money back in the, in, in, in the company, keep putting money in the back in the company because You've noticed the illustration that we've got. Each illustration costs quite a bit of money to make. And we've got uh, 40 of them. <laughs> so it racks up. Uh, K-cups, when you do the lids and all that stuff, it costs money. Everything costs money. You know, I, 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 my cups are actually in, in limbo because there's a strike on the, on the Pacific border, on the Pacific side, so the ports, the, the boat cannot park, the, the boat cannot be parked, and is what I'm told. And... Um, you have to order, uh, per types of cups, 50,000 cups. Okay, so let's say it's 10 cents a cup. It's still $5,000 times two sizes. That's $10,000. At $2 a cup, that means I gotta sell 5,000 cups of coffee before I can afford it. I mean, for me, that's the way we look at it, and it's, and it's quite difficult. Listen, if you're gonna do a business, don't get in a business that's at $2 a pop. I recommend $20 a pop. But anyway, that's just, um, that's just uh, you know, how to get richer faster kind of thing. But uh, never do it for money. That's another thing I've learned. But typically, it, it takes a while. It's really competitive out there. Um, I've developed some uh, Wi-Fi products, and I can tell you that, uh, again, by the time we got out, 
uh, it's, it's now it's under the brand of Extreme Networks. And, and when we got out, um, we thought we were one of few. It turns out that there were seven others and we're all competing against the same. That's in the iTech industry. And, <clears throat> and that particular company didn't make money for three, four years. But investors, you need to have a plan. Like I didn't touch on the business case. Oh, you better have a business plan, absolutely. But there's a lot of good material out there to do good business plan, so. And I don't want to divulge a lot of things that are coming up tomorrow, but there's a lot of exciting things coming for us. Um, and um, yeah, I'll just leave it to that. One, one, of the things that you, one of the things that you said is that you got to look at the market, um, you know, the metronome or the, uh, you know, the temperature of the market and so on. One of the things that we've noticed when we started is, and we were very early at identifying this in Sudbury, is that we noticed there was starting to be a change of trend of people going to local instead of big box stores. For some of you entrepreneurs, that's almost natural that you would think that. But it, let me give you an interesting story. We were in California, and when we lived in California, down the street, there was this other couple, friends of ours, and um, she, she just had a, a job, you know, uh, and she was wanted to show it and, and so we went there and it was a big party and and as I'm walking around I hear Sudbury holy geez here I am in San Jose California and I hear Sudbury so of course I approach and I start listening and when they're done conversing I'm going you, somebody mentioned Sudbury and this lovely lady goes yes I, I did I'm going holy geez so I was smart my my ancestors uh, some of my ancestors come from Massachusetts so I said did you come from Sudbury, Massachusetts? Are you, you mentioned Sudbury, Massachusetts. She goes, no, Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. I'm going, oh my God, that's where I'm from. Is that where you're from? Oh no, no, I'm from LA. Oh, well, what's the connection? She goes, well, um, I'm actually going to try a product in Sudbury. Wow, and she gave me the brand. I think it was, it was some big name, um, big name brand. And, and I'm going, wow, Sudbury, well, why Sudbury? Uh, she goes, well, people don't support local there. They only support big box stores. So we know if we test the product there, if it works, it's got a good chance to work elsewhere. All of a sudden I'm going, <laughs> whoa. So I'm, of course, defending Sudbury, and I'm saying, that can't be true. I said, did you try North Bay and Sault Ste. Marie? She goes, oh, I know these cities, and we know about them. But no, it doesn't work there because they support local. But Sudbury always works. Holy jeez. So when we started the business, we knew we were getting into that area. We knew that localization was not a big part, but our test from the farmer's market and Carol's basically you know, wanting to keep pursuing this basically proved to us that the tide was changing. And now we're seeing more and more of localized, uh, you know, local, local uh, businesses uh, because there is value, there is value. And the value is for us, Again, it's that relationship, that, you know, that connectivity, and of course, it's a pretty fresh product. You know, I mentioned all the bins. Did you know that the coffee, uh, well, some people, uh, well, the coffee in the bins, they stay in the bins for not more than three days. That's how often Carol goes and churns through the beans, three days. If you know your coffee, you know that ground coffee starts losing its freshness within three hours. Okay, beans start losing freshness within two months. So people starting to get that, and there is a difference when you actually ground it. We're not supporters of K-Cups because we believe that if we did taste tests, and of course, a, a grounded coffee with grounded beef, good beans, compared to a K-Cup, oh, it's miles away in terms of taste experience, but people like it for practicality, and that's why we decided. In fact, our business case shows that uh, we're gonna, we could gain up to 50% revenue without any impact on existing revenue by having K-Cups. Um, and we have at least one person a day asking for K-Cups at the store, so kind of putting it all together, that's why we're doing it. Um, but, yeah. Thank you, great questions.